Hi, so I'm Jesse, and I'm going to talk about the evolutionary potential of the SARS coronavirus 2 receptor binding domain. Uh, so the work I'm going to talk about uh, today, or the first part, was done by Tyler, who's a postdoc in my lab, uh, Ali, who's a graduate student in my lab, and then with some assistance from Sarah, who's another graduate student in my lab. Uh, so, you know, this is a image of a SARS coronavirus. Uh, and on the surface of this virus are these spike proteins, which mediate viral entry into cells. And one part of the spike protein is the receptor binding domain uh, shown here in pink. And this receptor binding domain can adopt two major conformations. It can be in what's called the down conformation here. And then it can also extend into something called an up conformation, and when it's in the up conformation, it can engage the ACE2 receptor on cells and mediate viral entry. And just uh, in case anyone's going to be uh, curious, because I'm going to be talking about mutations to this receptor binding domain, the D614G mutation, which Betty's going to talk about uh, in the next talk, uh, is not part of the receptor binding domain. So I'm not going to talk uh, at all about that mutation, but for those who are interested, it might influence the dynamics of these receptor binding uh, domains. And it's an interesting mutation, but it's not going to be in the scope of my talk, and you'll hear about that uh, in the next talk. Uh, so this receptor binding domain is a really important determinant of viral tropism. So here's an alignment of uh, sarbacoviruses, so viruses that are sort of related to SARS coronavirus. Uh, here in blue is SARS coronavirus, and the two uh, most closely related uh, uh, animal viruses that have been found, uh, sort of closely related to it is SARS-CoV-1, and then here's various other uh, uh, other isolates of sarbacoviruses. And almost all of these viruses uh, have been isolated and are known to infect uh, bats, but there's a few of these viruses that uh, have infected humans or uh, in some cases related species such as pangolins and, and palm civets, uh, in particular SARS coronavirus 2 and SARS coronavirus 1. And a really important aspect of those viruses being able to infect humans was this receptor binding domain shown here in pink, uh, acquiring the ability to bind strongly to the ACE2 uh, variant that humans have. Uh, so I'm first going to talk about uh, deep mutational scanning uh, as a technique to really sort of map the functional constraints. So how do impacts to this receptor binding domain influence its ability to bind receptor? And I'm going to do that in three parts. I'm first going to describe the experimental assay that we're using to look at this. I'm then going to describe what it tells us about sort of structure function relationships in the RBD. And then finally, I'm going to talk about how we can use the data to analyze SARS-CoV-2 genetic variation. So viruses that are circulating out there in the human population now. So first is the experimental assay. So one of our goals in doing these experiments was be able to measure how mutations affect the receptor binding domain sort of in very high throughput and very accurately. And one way we can do that is we can take the receptor binding domain and we can simply express it on the surface of yeast cells uh, attached to the yeast cell as drawn here. And then we can take ACE2, which is labeled with a fluorescent marker, and uh, sort of bind that to the receptor binding domain. And so if you do that, you can then run the yeast through a flow cytometer and you get a binding curve, just like you get a binding curve between any two molecules that bind to each other. Whereas when you have uh, no ACE2, there's no fluorescent signal. And then as you add more and more ACE2, the fluorescent signal goes up and finally you saturate the binding and it sort of plateaus off. And so if you were to just look at the cytometry data, you can create what's called a binding curve, where you have this, this hill curve-like relationship uh, between how much ACE2 you have and uh, how much binding you have on the y-axis. And you can, for instance, determine a dissociation constant, which is how strongly does this receptor binding domain uh, bind to ACE2. And so we can put different receptor binding domains on yeast do this experiment off of different receptor binding domains on this tree. So here, for instance, is just showing a dissociation curve for SARS coronavirus 2, which binds to ACE2 really well. It's showing it for SARS coronavirus 1, which also binds to ACE2 quite well, uh, for this pangolin uh, receptor binding domain, which actually binds to ACE2 even better 
than SARS coronavirus 2, and then for various uh, bat isolates, which bind more weakly or not at all. And so you could imagine you could put clone lots of different receptor binding domains into your yeast and generate lots of different binding curves uh, in this form. However, we really wanted to generate lots of these binding curves, like thousands or hundreds of thousands of them. So we took uh, a, a more systematic approach. Uh, and what we did is we took uh, the SARS coronavirus 2 receptor binding domain and we simply used PCR to sort of tile mutations across this receptor binding domain. So we end up with a large library of receptor binding domains, each of which have different amino acid mutations sort of strewn about the sequence. Uh, we then added uh, a little nucleotide barcode at the end of that receptor binding domain and uh, just transformed these things into yeast. So we now have you know, a huge uh, flask of yeast, uh, each of which is expressing a different mutant of this receptor binding domain, and each of which has a little nucleotide tag uh, that will depend on which receptor binding domain it has. We then used long read PAC biosequencing to link the, the tag at the end here to the full sequence of the receptor binding domain. And what that means is now sort of forever forward, we can just do a short Illumina sequencing of 16 nucleotide sequence out of the yeast and know which receptor binding domain mutant it's expressing. So once we had these yeasts, we can then do these massively parallel uh, titration experiments. So I was describing to you how if you have one receptor binding domain, you can titrate in the amount of ACE2 ligand and you get this dose response, which you can use to fit a dissociation curve. So now what if you have a library of hundreds of thousands of different receptor binding domains as shown here? You can still take these, uh, this population of yeast and incubate them with different concentrations of ACE2 and then put them in a flow cytometer. And what you're now gonna see are data like this where you can see these histograms are more spread out. And the reason is because we're no longer looking at one receptor binding domain, we're looking at hundreds of thousands of different ones. And there are some, such as the ones over here that don't bind ACE2, even at the highest concentration of ACE2. And there are a few like the ones here that bind ACE2 even better uh, than the unmutated or wild type. And so we can then just flow sort these, take each of these bins, sequence to see which receptor binding domain is in there and sort of in one shot construct hundreds of hundreds and thousands of titration curves. And this is just showing you sort of completely randomly drawn titration curves uh, from these hundreds of thousands of RBD variants. And you can see they look pretty good. At the bottom here are some variants that bind ACE2 as you'd expect. At the top are a couple of, uh, of uh, receptor binding domains that are totally non-functional. So what this gives us uh, is a quantitative measurement of how each mutation to the receptor binding domain affects binding to ACE2. Uh, so I'm gonna show these data uh, in this form. So can people now see a web page? Uh, all right, if, you, if yes. you're not seeing a web, <laughs> yes, okay. If you're yeah. not seeing a web page. So, so there's a lot of data here. So we've created this little, this little interactive uh, web app that you can go, uh, go look at. So basically for any mutation of interest, so that's just arbitrarily look here. This is uh, position 350, which is norm, which is a veiling in, in most SARS coronavirus uh, two sequences. And you can look and you can see, all right, if we mutate that veiling to a methionine, what happens? So the red color here means that that mutation is very bad for the receptor binding domain's ability to bind ACE2. And it's also rather bad for the receptor binding domains expression. So that's probably not a mutation uh, you'd see in nature. But you can look at interesting uh, uh, sort of subsets of sites. So for instance, we can go and we can look at uh, the ACE2 contact sites in SARS coronavirus 2. And you can now <clears throat> see several things that are sort of interesting biochemically. So at many ACE2 contact sites, such as 489 here, Mutating it to anything else is bad for receptor binding. All the colors in this column are red. Uh, but there are some sites, such as site 501, which is normally an asparagine, where there are actually at least four mutations that are shown here in blue. So in particular, uh, mutation N501F makes the uh, receptor binding domain actually substantially better at binding to human ACE2. You can also see from this map the existence of what's called uh, sort of stability uh, binding trade-offs, where there's a lot of sites uh, 
you know, such as, for instance, site 455 here, where if you mutate it to almost anything else, it gets blue. So the RBD becomes more stable, is expressed better on the surface of yeast cells, but it becomes worse at binding to ACE2. So I'm not going to go through these, uh, like all these detail data in great detail. I'm going to highlight a few general trends. But what, what I hope people, one thing I hope people appreciate from this talk is that if you're looking at the RBD and you see a mutation and you want to know what does that do to the ability of this protein to bind human ACE2, and what does it do to the expression of properly folded uh, receptor binding domain, which we think correlates pretty well with stability, there's this map here where you can just go look it up. And that can be useful, I think, in certain circumstances because you don't have to make it yourself and, and test it out. So, uh, all right, hopefully people can see my PowerPoint slides again. If you can't, uh, someone say something. Uh, and so, so one of the things that we found in that map that I was pointing out in those examples is there are actually some mutations to the SARS coronavirus 2 receptor binding domain that make it bind to human ACE2 even better uh, than, than current SARS coronavirus 2 does. And we tested these along with a variety of other mutations in pseudotype lentiviral particles. And so for instance, uh, the two mutations that have a really big effect on increasing uh, ACE2 binding Q498Y and N501F both uh, increase uh, infection of cells by the pseudotype lentivirus uh, a little bit. So these, these blue points are a little bit higher than one where wild type lies, whereas the mutations that are bad for ACE2 binding generally decrease uh, by a lot, lot of large amount the, the, the infectiousness of these lentivirus pseudotypes. So importantly, we don't think that this is probably the case for real SARS coronavirus 2 because uh, you know, these lentiviral pseudotypes are looking at a single round of infection. And we see no evidence that these sorts of mutations that increase ACE2 binding affinity are being selected in the human population, even though they're, uh, they're sort of uh, clearly evolutionarily accessible. But I, but I just sort of wanted to point this out. We're not doing live virus experiments in our lab, but for anybody who is, I think it would be interesting to characterize uh, what are the effects of these mutations that increase ACE2 binding uh, on actual live virus. And you might speculate that during multi-cycle viral growth, for instance, there could be some balance between cellular attachment and cellular detachment. And maybe the virus has tuned that balance pretty well and making the attachment stronger, although it's beneficial in a pseudotype lentiviral particle might not be beneficial in nature. But I think it's an interesting question. And I think something that's worth doing is sort of keeping an eye on these mutations that increase uh, ACE2 binding affinity and seeing if there's any action there during natural evolution. Uh, we also think there are just some, some things that come out of this data set that aren't necessarily uh, sort of scientifically or evolutionarily interesting, but could just be super useful. So in our experiment, we found some mutants to this receptor binding domain that greatly increased the expression of the protein. And that's sort of shown here. So here's, this is now mammalian expressed receptor binding domain. Here's how much you get out of a sort of given amount of mammalian cells uh, for the wild type. And then the the five mutants we found that have the biggest effect on increasing expression, here's the yield you get out. So it's increased a lot. Uh, and correspondingly, uh, four of these five mutations also increase the thermal stability of the receptor binding domain by anywhere from uh, two to five degrees. So uh, I don't want to read anything into the evolutionary implications of this because this is isolated receptor binding domain. But receptor binding domain is one of the major antigens that's being used in vaccines. And we think putting in these types of expression enhancing and stabilizing mutations uh, might be a useful thing if you were to be making a uh, receptor binding domain based vaccine. Okay, so I've already know I've put too much uh, in this talk. So uh, I'm going to just skip uh, the next part. Basically, you can look at the effects of mutations in the context of the structure and you can sort of rationalize the structural constraint on different parts of the of the receptor binding domain. And here's a link to a web page, which is also uh, in our paper on this, which makes it very easy to do this interactively, but I'm not gonna go into that now. Uh, the main trend that we see, however, is that typically there is a strong correlation between the stability for which in our experiments expression is a proxy of the receptor binding domain and how well it binds to ACE2 on the y-axis. And this is sort of uh, expected from the biochemistry of small binding proteins. We sort of know that when proteins are stable, they're often able to 
to sort of bind better because there, there's less uh, conformational loss of conformational entropy associated with binding. And that's why there's this sort of strong positive correlation. The points that fall off this line in blue here are all of the points that sort of directly uh, contact ACE2. And this is sort of another well-known thing for proteins that usually a large fraction of a protein sequence is fairly optimized uh, for stability, but the parts of the protein that are directly engaged in the function, which in this case is binding to ACE2, are typically optimized more to bind ACE2 than uh, you know, for protein folding. And so often if you mutate those, you can then uh, substantially increase stability at the cost of uh, not binding ACE2 very well anymore. Uh, and then one thing that we can do, uh, and I'm just gonna give a very cursory view of this, uh, and you'll see uh, sort of much more about this in the next talk, is we can use uh, these uh, sorts of data to start informing analyses of SARS-CoV-2 genetic variation. And again, we really hope anybody studying the natural evolution of this virus will just go look up these data sets, which are all available and sort of do the same thing I'm showing here uh, more systematically. So this is just a slide to show that as everyone knows, there's like a ton of SARS coronavirus 2 sequences uh, out there. This is already outdated, but there's a lot of sequences on this tree. Uh, and so one of the things we can do is we can go through these sequences and we can say uh, of all of the mutations that are observed among the virus, and this is already uh, slightly outdated, what is the effect of mutations, uh, of these mutations on the ability of the virus to bind ACE2? And so if we look at all singleton mutations, so mutations observed only once among natural sequences, some of which could be sequencing errors, we can see that most of the mutations have very little effect on ACE2 binding and some are highly deleterious. We would postulate that these mutations observed in natural sequences that are highly deleterious might be sequencing errors. Uh, once you start to filter on mutations found more than once, you can see that the effect of the mutations converges uh, almost to zero with just a few outliers. And when you look at mutations found greater than two or greater than six times, you can see that their effects on ACE2 binding uh, are essentially zero. And importantly, again, as I was explaining, this is not true of like the average mutation or the typical mutation to this protein. Most mutations affect ACE2 binding, usually by making it worse and for a couple of dozen cases by making it better. But it seems like the mutations uh, it, that are present currently at uh, any appreciable frequency in the human population have effectively no effect on ACE2 binding, which would suggest that, that maintenance of ACE2 binding at the current affinity is probably under pretty strong purifying selection. And we can do the same thing for how mutations are affecting the stability of the receptor binding domain. Uh, and I just want to emphasize again, there's no observable selection for improved ACE2 binding affinity, even though if you look in these maps I was showing you just for single mutations, you can see lots of blue points where there are at least a dozen blue points where there are single nucleotide mutations that could enable the virus to bind ACE2 better. Uh, and we did some statistical testing of that that I'm not gonna get into. Uh, so, okay, so the second thing I wanted to talk about uh, is what about possible evolution to escape from antibodies? So the receptor binding domain, which again shown here is in pink, one thing that it does is bind ACE2 as I just described. It also turns out that many of the most potent neutralizing antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 bind to this receptor binding domain. And here in these cartoons are just the structures of some of the antibodies in the literature that bind to all sorts of different exposed faces of the receptor binding domain. And so uh, one thing that, that we wanted to do is start to also use these libraries to map out the antigenic effects of mutations to the receptor binding domain. So which mutations uh, would uh, affect binding by these antibodies. And our reasoning was sort of uh, in the same way I've described to you how it might be useful to sort of have in hand a map of how all mutations affect ACE2 binding. So for instance, when some mutation pops up, you can look up what it does. We figured it might be useful to have similar information about how mutations affect the antigenicity of the RBT. And so the work I'm gonna describe here was done by Tyler and Ali in my lab uh, in collaboration with Seth Zost and James Crow at Vanderbilt, who uh, gave us a number of human monoclonal antibodies targeting the receptor binding domain. And so the basic way we wanted to look at this, and again, just to emphasize our goal is rather than to do escape mutant selections, which are a valuable uh, thing, but sort of allow you to identify individual mutations that might escape an antibody. Our goal is to just really have a complete map 
of what are all of the mutations for each of these antibodies that affect its binding to receptor binding DNA. So you can basically do the same assay I was showing you before, where you take the receptor binding domain on the surface of yeast and you bind an antibody to it. And if you do that, you'll get a flow cytometry plot like this, where all the receptor binding domains have a whole bunch of antibody bounds. So they're all high up here. But now if you were to do that same experiment with instead the mutant library of SARS coronavirus 2 RBDs, most of the points are going to be up here because the antibody binds well but there are going to be some points that sort of drop off because these are mutants that the antibody doesn't bind to as well. And so we can then separate uh, this pre-selection population from the antibody escape population and deep sequence both of them to figure out which mutations are there. And I'm going to represent those data in the form of these logo plots where anywhere there's a site where mutations uh, escape from the receptor binding domain, uh, a taller letter means that that mutation has a larger effect on escape. So in this cartoon example, uh, changing site 483 to a T has a large effect on escaping uh, from this hypothetical antibody. Uh, so we applied this approach to 10 human antibodies, and I'm just going to kind of navigate what the results look like. So first, to kind of orient uh, everybody, I'm going to take the receptor binding domain, and I'm going to use colors to divide it into three sort of arbitrary subsets of sites. Uh, orange is the core receptor binding domain, which is a part of the receptor binding domain that sort of forms a scaffold for binding ACE2, but doesn't directly interact with ACE2 itself. Uh, light blue is what's called the receptor binding motif. So it's these loops that come out and touch ACE2. And then dark blue are the residues that actually make physical contact or or for angstrom interatomic contact uh, with ACE2 itself. So here's just showing two uh, example antibodies uh, from the Crow lab, uh, which have these names, COVE2-2165 and COVE2-2832, which you don't really have to worry about. And we mapped, again, the effects of mutations at every site in the receptor binding domain on uh, binding by the antibody. And for both of these antibodies, there's only a few sites where mutations uh, ablate antibody binding. And so you can see, for instance, for 2165, uh, it targets near the receptor binding uh, surface. And two of those escape mutations are uh, at color, sites colored dark blue, so sites that contact ACE2. And then there's uh, one here in orange, which is in the core RBD. And this other antibody, COVE22832, uh, selects slightly different escape mutations. So you can see there's a lot of antibody to antibody idiosyncrasies here. Uh, so they both select escape mutations at 487, but only at uh, 486 do the mutations escape the second antibody. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to show it here, but we have uh, extensive pseudovirus neutralization assay uh, validation that these mutations, in fact, have these effects. Uh, and so here's over 10 different antibodies. So now this becomes a lot to look at. And I don't really expect you to <laughs> absorb it all. But the point is, for each of these antibodies, we now have a map of which mutations uh, escape from the antibody. And in general, uh, there are different mutations that escape from lots of these different antibodies, although hopefully you can see that some of them are selecting at sort of the same sites. And some of them are targeting more the core RBD. Some of them are targeting the receptor binding motif, et cetera. To sort of organize this information, maybe in a similar way to uh, how people organize it, say, single cell RNA-seq, we use multidimensional scaling to sort of collapse this information down. So this is now showing a two-dimensional projection of which of these antibodies are close to each other in this space of escape mutations. So, so you instance, have uh, two minutes to wrap okay. up. So for instance, these two antibodies uh, have very similar escape mutations. So you probably wouldn't want to put them in a cocktail together. Whereas, for instance, this antibody and this antibody have very distinct escape mutations. And I hope one thing you can appreciate from this projection is that sometimes antibodies targeting the same region, so like this one and this one both primarily target uh, ACE2 contact residues, nonetheless have highly distinct escape mutations. And then just the last thing I'll point out is now that we have these antigenic maps, we can go through all of the uh, naturally circulating viruses and say how many have mutations out of about 75,000 viruses we looked at that would escape one of these monoclonal antibodies. And this is just showing that uh, there are a number of mutations uh, that are quite low. So none of them is observed more than 31 times, but there are some already some viruses out there 
uh, at low frequency that would escape from some of these monoclonal antibodies or have escape mutations from some of these monoclonal antibodies. And we think these maps will be increasingly valuable uh, as the virus continues to evolve to sort of monitor the possible antigenic effects of, of these viral mutations. Uh, and then we also have uh, some interactive views and et cetera of these data, which I'm going to skip in the interest of time. So as a summary, uh, we, our, our basic goal has been to generate phenotypic effects of the maps of the effects of these mutations, which we hope could be a tool that's useful for people doing uh, viral genomic surveillance, uh, as well as people doing basic science studies of, of these proteins. And we've now made a map of the effects of all mutations on the receptor binding domain's ability to bind ACE2 and the expression of properly folded protein. As, we, as I said, we think this is useful for understanding viral evolution and will also be useful to apply to sarbacoviruses more broadly to understand which ones could uh, adapt to bind human ACE2. Uh, we also are now building these complete maps of antibody escape mutations, which I showed you some examples of, and we think those could be useful both for designing antibody cocktails with completely orthogonal sets of escape mutations and also for sort of uh, having functional data to directly interpret the antigenic consequences of mutations that might be observed in natural viral sequences. And just sort of to end, I'd like to thank uh, my funding sources. And then I'd also again like to thank Tyler, uh, Ali, and Sarah in my group who uh, led all the work I was discussing, and also our collaborators, Seth Zost and James Crow at Vanderbilt. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Justin, for that uh, very um, interesting talk. If people want to ask questions, raise your hands. If we run out of question time, use the Q&A function and uh, you can write questions and the speakers can answer them. I just want to lead off with two related questions. Is it uh, correct to interpret your data as suggesting that increased affinity for ACE2 does not necessarily confer an advantage for the virus? And related to that, are there known ACE2 uh, receptor mutations or variations that affect the affinity um, and could imp uh, impact on the uh, <clears throat> clinical effect of the virus in individual patients? Yeah, those are both great questions. So I would interpret our data, uh, I mean, I guess we, we can't say what's going to happen in the future, and I can't say for sure that uh, improved ACE2 affinity doesn't help the virus, but I, we can say that there are mutations that are clearly accessible to the virus, like it can get by single nucleotide mutations that allow it to bind to ACE2 better than the current virus does. And there's not evidence that any of those mutations have been strongly selected in the human population in the way that, for instance, the mutation that Betty's going to talk about next uh, has. So I would, uh, I mean, it's hard to say that it's not because maybe there's been incomplete evolutionary sampling or something, although I think that's becoming unlikely given how much this virus has circulated. So I would speculate uh, that at this point there isn't strong selection for increased ACE2 affinity, uh, although obviously we're just going to have to wait and continue to see what happens as the virus evolves. But certainly for a number of other viruses such as influenza virus uh, and also even the OC43 uh, human common cold coronavirus, it's been established that viruses need to abide their receptors with pretty good affinity, but there's often a, a diminishing returns or even trade-off where at some point uh, binding to receptor even better doesn't help the virus uh, more. As far as your second question, I believe there is some level of uh, polymorphism in human ACE2, uh, but we haven't directly looked ourselves in terms of how that affects uh, viral binding. So I think it's a good question, but we haven't looked at that. And we're at this point more focused on looking at how mutations affect binding to ACE2 of other animal species to try to understand sort of the deeper evolution of this virus more. Thank you. Uh, Raul, um, you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Yes. Hello, oh, Jesse. How are you doing? Hey, Raul. Good to uh, almost see you. <laughs> almost see me. Uh, no, I was, I was following to your, uh, your last question. So uh, uh, it's very interesting. I mean, this evolution from, or if this is coming from pangolins and bats and all these uh, things. I don't know if you have some thoughts about, uh, I mean, if this purifying selection was already there or there is kind of uh, adaptation and when this adaptation could have happened. Yeah, I mean, so this is a great question. So uh, Raul's question is basically, what about this virus sort of before it came a human pandemic? And I mean, we can say there's not evidence of really strong selection for these ACE2 binding affinity mutations since, you know, early January when the first sequence was obtained. So then a question was, did this virus like hit 
in humans with the ability already to bind ACE2 sort of at a pretty optimized level? Or was there some cryptic evolution in humans uh, where it got better at binding human ACE2 sort of before the sequences that are currently released? Uh, I mean, we don't really have data to uh, answer that question. I think for the original SARS coronavirus, where it's much clearer uh, sort of exactly the source of the virus that came into humans, there was a lot more evidence for adaptation uh, to bind uh, human ACE2 sort of early in the virus's evolution. I, I will, the only interesting thing that our data really, so other than the fact that it's an interesting question we can't answer it, the only thing that we found interesting is that the, in the it was in the one of the slides I showed earlier, the GD pangolin vi, uh, RBD, so that's the RBD yeah. from one of these early pangolin isolates, yes, actually yes. binds to human ACE2 better than SARS coronavirus 2. So that's super interesting. And one of the things that we're working on is doing these experiments with uh, you know, a broader array of viruses and also a broader array of ACE2. So whether that's just a feature that pangolin ACE2 is really similar to humans or whether that there's some other reason for that, uh, I, I can't comment, but yeah, so, so I don't um, know. Could I, could uh, I Jesse, if you, could, uh, if you could unshare your slides and let uh, Betty, and then- I just would like to make a quick comment on that last uh, uh, discussion. Um, I was working with Fang Gao at Duke and we, um, we and others have seen there's the, the, the ACE2 binding domain from Pangolin recombined very specifically into the RATG13. So it's a region that came in through recombination um, and it, it's quite precise and it's just that region. So I think that was an en enabling evolutionary event and recombination is extremely important in the evolutionary history of coronaviruses in general, of both of the SARS viruses, um, I think it was an absolutely critical step uh, for this virus to, to be able to move into humans, but it's also very important in the history of SARS-1. So that just, just some food for thought, but in particular, the ACE2 binding domain from pangolin hopped into the, the RATG13 background. 